Cobra was an excellent ship and it always got me everywhere I wanted to go. Four of the five times that I got shot down was a single shot, 30 caliber. It just happened to hit something. But <laughs> so it wasn't even any special anti-aircraft guns. It was just some. It was someone taking pot shots yeah. at you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. With those Chinese AKs and the Mosin Nagans and stuff. Yeah. And it just happened to hit a tail rotor blade or a tail rotor gearbox or an engine oil bypass valve or something, and it just. Jesus, here we go. We plopped it down and, and uh, called a Chinook to sling it out for us. And, yeah. And, uh, but uh, Cobra was an excellent, excellent. Uh, they, had, yeah, they had a Cobra transition school in Vietnam over at Benoit. Is that for when you're learning the Cobra after flying on another helicopter? Right. Okay. It's just a transition course. Is it easy to uh, transition from a uh, loach to a, a Cobra? Uh, different flying altogether, but yeah, you can eventually, uh, eventually do it. I tried to fly a loach one time and hell, I thought what was it? But the Cobra is solid. You and your wingman carry 152 rockets and 16,000 rounds of minigun. Mm -hmm. And not many people will shoot at you. Yeah. And those that do, <laughs> they wish they hadn't. But uh, that was the best helicopter we had at the time. That was the fastest and most heavily armed helicopter, military helicopter in the world at, at that time. Uh, and you had to go to school for a month just to transition into it. Wow. It was, I was the third group to go through that course and we had sent people from our unit and they all flunked out. I was the first one to pass that the maintenance officer and I were the first two to graduate. Wow. Uh, was it hard to aim the minigun? No. Nah, no? Nah, it's like aiming a water hose. Okay. Okay. And how many rounds uh, did that minigun hold? You, uh, about uh, 8,000. 8,000? Yeah. But how fast would you go through that? Uh, uh, just, just a couple of minutes. Okay. Uh, They'd, they'd put their head down. Yeah. Um, most times they wouldn't even shoot at you. Because they didn't want to reveal their position? So, well, no, because they didn't want to end up in a damn hole about the half size of a swimming pool. Right. If they didn't shoot at you, you didn't know where they were? No, not for the most part. No. Uh, unless you had infantry on the ground and you'd say, you see that skag tree right there? Yeah. And there's a patch of elephant grass right there. He said, I've got a machine gun in that. He said, okay. Put the crosshairs on there and go pew pew. And it, it'd blow a hole big as this room. Yeah, so you'd use the rockets before you use the minigun oh, yeah, usually? yeah, yeah, you'd use the rockets. Yeah, because uh, the minigun, you had to be more precise with it? Uh, no, you just, that, it doesn't take much to empty the minigun. Oh, okay. Uh, but different rockets, different minigun. Uh, when, when we were on this mission here, we got a call out and they said, okay, we're, uh, you've got a, on your FM radio, you've got to own, uh, a standby on, Home and home. Uh, and inside you've got a, a, a compass row with numbers on it that goes around and there's a magnetic needle in there operating by your radio. And if I transmit to you, that, that needle picks up your signal and points to where you are. So oh, neat. 
fly that arrow, and when I fly over you, it'll go around because I went over you. You passed me, yeah. So I, I, I knew exactly where you were. I didn't know where I was. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's, a, that's a misnomer. That's some kind of propaganda that was put out by flight school. That, mm -hmm. uh, a helicopter pilot in Vietnam always knows where it is. That's bullshit. Yeah. Uh, most times we didn't. We knew we were in the air, but we didn't know. Who the hell it all looks the same? It's all black. Yeah. And I could find you, and that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And when I flew down there, he said, can you put in some artillery? And I said, no. Well, how come? Because I don't know the coordinates of... You can't tell what coordinates on the oh, map are? Shit, no, it's like looking in an inkwell. Yeah. Uh, and the map's worthless. Yeah. And you can't open a map in a Cobra. It's like opening a bed sheet. And, yeah. And you can't see. Yeah. So we, no, we didn't use that. We used radio... Uh, the needles. Radio needle to, no, I could find you. Uh, and, I said, and, w and was that for all the allies? Like you could find like an Arvin platoon or you could you find, find anybody on an air with a radio? radio. The, you also had a UHF, a VHF, but they used UHF from helicopter to airport and a VHF they used from helicopter to helicopter, and uh, FM, they used that air to ground. But yeah. anyway, uh, when you would, I, 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 I call, I said, uh, uh, Bob, I know where, I know the coordinates of that village. Let me put, I said, what are you up against? And he said, well, we're laying in this village, uh, south of the village of Ep Gokong. So we're laying in freshly fertilized rice paddy. Because you can imagine. It smells pretty bad. And he says, and that rice paddy is about a mile long and a half a mile wide. And, and I said, okay, what's your problem? And he says, there are about a hundred people in here with us. I said, no kidding? He said, no kidding. I said, well, let me see if I can adjust their bit of thinking here. So I knew what the, the coordinates of the village were. So I called an artillery outfit and they would shoot parachute flares that would deploy at 1,500 feet and they would, they would light up magnesium flares. Man, it was just like daylight. And because at night, you can't make a gun run on the river because you don't no, know you don't when to pull anything. out. Yeah. So I said, tell you what I'll do. I'll, I'll, um, I'll light up that village and then I'll go down and come in low level and all of these people walking around, it, they'll be stick figures and they'll be backlit. And we fired some... Uh, about 152 rockets and 16,000 rounds of ammunition. Man, you could see body parts flying up. Wow. <laughs> Here and there and everything. But we had to do it on the ground, uh, and then we just skate off to the side. And uh, he said, well, we got them running. Uh, he said, but the, uh, we, counted, uh, we counted over 100. And I said, well, and we were counting them too, my co-pilot and I, and, and uh, my wingman and his co-pilot, we were counting them too. And I said, uh, I think there was over a hundred. He says, I think there was over a hundred. And this general who was in a tactical operations center monitoring this from a 12 foot hole, it was air conditioned, in front of a refrigerator full of beer and a television. Oh, well, there's not that many enemy in the area. And I said, well, sir, uh, both my wingman and I are college graduates and both our co-pilots are college graduates. And I know for a fact that at least two people in that patrol have a year of college. 
So that's, I'm pretty sure six of us can count to a hundred. Yeah. Get off my radio. I didn't know it was a general at the time. <laughs> and I said, okay. So uh, the only way I could get those people out was to move them and move about as far as from here to the door. That was, that's where the river was. They couldn't go any further than that. And I said, Bob, I called the patrol leader Bob. He was Sergeant Elsner. Sometimes, sometimes he was a Sergeant E6. Sometimes he was sort of, sometimes he was a private, depending on who he'd smarted off to. <laughs> but tonight he was Bob. So I said, Bob, have you got any Claymore mines left? And, and uh, he said, Yeah, I got four. And I said, Well, they've got you surrounded. And I said, I think you're outnumbered about 15 or 16 to 1. I'll tell you what else do. Set out two of your Claymore mines, put one on 12 and one on two, and put the other two on 135 degree asthma. When I say blow it, you run like hell on 135 degree asthma. Okay, get ready, Bob. And I said, blow it and run like hell. So he blew those and blew those and took off running. And right before he got to the river, he hit that grass and laid down. So I went in low level. I was out of ammunition. They were out of ammunition. So I just went to a went to a hover about that high off the ground. Two of them, uh, they got on a, a, the rocket pods on that side and the patrol leader and radio operator got on uh, the skids on the other side. And as soon as they got on, I pulled that collective up. They just went straight up to 1,500 feet. Wow. And um, I took 16 hits on the way up, but we didn't hit anything that would hurt us. Yeah. So, so anyway, we took them down and uh, dropped them off at a watering plant. And my wingman and his uh, co-pilot, there were two captains flying on my wing that night. I was a, I was the first lieutenant at that time. They didn't go by rank much. They went by, hey, if you can do the job, do it. I don't give a shit what your rank is. So yeah. That worked. Uh, and so I called and I said, get them ready, Bob. Here I come. Under no circumstance, if you don't get off my guy, you be, I ought to be glad I don't have any rockets left. <laughs> so I put it in there and they jumped on and pulled it up. And I called my co-pilot and I said, well, what are we going to do with them now? And he said, well, let's take them down to the water plant. He says, you know you've got a 20-minute fuel light on. And I said, yeah. My wingman, his came on and I told him, you go up to 2,000 feet, fly over the village, drop the rest of your machine gun in that village and fly home. I said, I'll be there shortly. Was that village near Fuloy? No, it was down on the river at a place called the Catcher's Mitt. Okay. And we were a good hour south of Fuloy. Okay. And, and was this a known BC village? Did you have it mapped out which ones uh, were uh, enemy and which ones you no, knew were no, friendly? No, radio needle took me to where they were. And okay. I said, we're surrounded. Okay. So I said, okay, there's not supposed to be any good guys in here at all. And I said, I, I, I count over 100, and my wingman counts over 100. He said, I'm looking at a starlight scope, and I count over 100. And the general got on the damn radio again. He said, well, there's not that man. They couldn't be, not in my area of operation. I said, well, you ought to get out of your bunker more. Uh, so I said, get off my radio. And, uh, I went ahead and picked him up, dropped him off at a watering plant. The two captains that were flying on my wing flew back to Fuloy and then I flew back. And I didn't think we were going to make it back. And my co-pilot said, sir, 
since I figured this three damn times, and I don't think we've got enough fuel to make that flight. And I said, well, let's examine this. And I said, now we've already blown off about 1,700 pounds of fuel, and we've already blown off a ton of rockets and ammunition. So we're almost two tons lighter than we were when we took off. Yeah. And he says, yeah. And I said, what, is it, what does it say to do when your, when your fuel warning light comes on? He said, when it comes on, the Cobra will fly at 2,000 feet. No, I'm sorry, at 1,500 feet, 150 miles an hour, for 20 minutes before the engine quits. Wow. And I said, well, so we've got a 22 minute flight on 20 minutes worth of fuel. I said, no. all right, look at your instruments. And I said, what are we flying at? He says, altitude 1,500 feet. I said, how fast? 150 knots. I said, how much, what percentage of power are we pulling? He says, about 25%. I said, what were we pulling when we came down here? And he said, 103%. I said, well, I think maybe we can stretch this out. We'll try, but just in case, plot us a course over the highway. I'll put the light down at the proper angle and cut it off. And if we have an engine fighter, we'll throttle off, put the thing on, and we'll just shoot our approach down that beam and hope that it's over the highway. And he says, okay. So we did. We made it back and had four gallons of fuel left. And uh, the, the old man sent his Jeep driver down, and he wanted to see me. I said, okay. He said, I, I said, tell him I'll be right there. I'm refueling the rear. He said, no, no, he said, come now. He said, sir, you take the Jeep and I'll stay here and I'll help him rearm. So, okay, so I went up there. He had, a, he had a, a, a kitchen table pulled up to the side of his desk. And he had all of his manuals laid out there. And all of them had 635 written on them, which is court martial manuals. And I said, somebody get a court martial? He said, well, you are to start with. And I said, okay. He says, ha, 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 did you lose any? And I said, no, sir, I didn't lose any. Lose any aircraft? No, sir, I didn't lose any aircraft. You want to tell me how you got back home? with a 22-minute flight on 20 minutes worth of fuel. And I said, well, we, we just eased it down and flew at a slower speed. And uh, he said, okay. He said, send those two captains in here. He says, I'm going to court-martial them too. So I said, what are you charging them with? He said, same thing I'm charging you with. Either collusion, that you colluded to disobey a, a direct order. Or, let's see, hell, I had that here somewhere. <laughs> Collusion or, I'll think of it, and uh, a, a conspiracy. Conspiracy. To <laughs> I mean, says, that, 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 that doesn't even exist in English. He says, I'll, I'll find it. <laughs> so, okay, so I went out and saw the two captains and I said, uh, they, they said, uh, I don't know, I don't know what we're going to do. Uh, I understand he's going to court martial us for what collusion or or what? I said, fuck him. Uh, he's trying to prove that you knew where they were and. You fired on them, and uh, I said, "No, you didn't." What happened when you had got the twenty-minute fuel light? He said, "What did I tell you to do?" He said, 
Uh, you told us to go 2,000 feet, fly over the village, dump the rest of our machine gun, and shoot a radio beam to, uh, back home. And I said, did you? And he said, well, well yeah. And I said, okay. So, by the time I decided whether or not I was going to pick them up, you were, you were in the next county. You were halfway home, and you didn't know anything about it because you were on a different frequency talking to a different person. And he said, yeah, 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 our, our careers are saved. And they, I said, an old man wants to see you. So they took about four or five steps, and one of the smarter of the two turned around and came back, and he said, Lieutenant, you planned this this way, didn't you? I said, maybe. <laughs> and he said, he said, well, I appreciate you covering our ass. You just saved our career. I don't know about yours, but you saved ours. And I said, shit, he won't. What's he going to do to me? I'm the best he's got. I said, well, that's true. So he didn't do anything. Nothing, absolutely nothing happened to him. Matter of fact, he got killed a week later. Mm. I don't know. Nobody cared for him much anyway. He wasn't fragged, was he? Uh, no. He, uh... We were up on Highway 13, off Highway 13, and an armored personnel carrier had gone across a landmine and it blew the uh, up through the armored personnel carrier, and there was a lieutenant sitting on it. Of course, it shredded him, and he got killed. And so I had my gunships at 1,500 feet, and I had my scouts at 1,700 feet, so that when we would fly around, we would see each other each time, and we everybody knew where everybody was. And I looked behind us, and. Here came the damn uh, troop commander, and he was flying an 086, uh, which was the new, uh, the new helicopter. And he had that son of a standing on his nose, just pulling the guts out of it. And I said to myself, that crazy bastard is going to do a cyclic climb and come right up in the middle of us. And I said, Mustangs go up another thousand, uh, uh, correction, uh, Scouts go up another thousand Mustangs stand out. And sure enough, man, he did. He pulled up and he was flying that way and here came one of the scouts around. They meshed rotor blades and cut each other's rotor blades off. And the scout said, Jesus Christ. Hit the ground and he the troop commander hit the ditch on the little side of the road and killed him too.